on this Friday night. You know, the intelligence services there are known for being fairly aggressive. A Canadian is detained in Nairobi after Tuesday's deadly terror attack. What his family here at home are saying tonight. If this is true, does it mean President Trump committed a crime? A damning new report says Donald Trump told his lawyer to lie to Congress. Is this the smoking gun that starts impeachment? Bullying. The Me Too movement against sexual Toxic harassment. masculinity. And our pop panel looks at the polarized reaction to Gillette's latest ad. Why it's gotten under so many people's skin and whether it was a smart move. This is The National. When militants stormed an upscale hotel complex in Nairobi earlier this week, the scenario that played out was gruesome and familiar. Masked and armed men, a bloody attack and many deaths. 21 people were killed, including a police officer. But today the story took an unexpected turn. Among several people rounded up by Kenyan authorities as possible accomplices, one, the man in the white shirt, is a Canadian. Evan Dyer explains what we know. Run down! This was Al-Shabaab's biggest attack on Nairobi since the Westgate Mall massacre five years ago. Kenyan authorities say the gunmen, some of whom were captured on CCTV just before the attack, are all dead. Today, five people appeared in court as potential accessories to the attack, suspected of providing cars, phones and other logistical help. One of them is Canadian Abdi Hakim Guled. I don't understand for the Okay. You don't understand Yes, I don't. An expired Canadian passport issued in Edmonton shows he was born in Somalia 46 years ago. A still valid driver's license shows he lived at this West End Toronto home. His brother, who still lives there, didn't want his face on camera. He was a truck driver, working man, family man. Has nothing to do with what they are talking about. Nothing at all. He went there to bring his family back. Nairobi's chief prosecutor told CBC that Guled hasn't yet been charged. And the courts have agreed to give us 30 days. There was a phone call that was made by one of the terrorists to his, uh, to his number. Police want to know why he got that call on the day of the attack. Kenyan police have arrested a number of people with connections to the gunmen, including people who bought cell phones and taxi drivers who ferried them around. The intelligence services there are known for being fairly aggressive, so, you know, that there's a wide net that's been cast is not at all surprising. Until about five years ago, al-Shabaab was a major draw for Western jihadists. It's believed about 20 traveled from Canada. But then the war in Syria began. There hasn't been um, the, the patterns of recruitment for al-Shabaab that you saw in, before Syria started. Canada sees Kenya as an important security partner in the region, but that doesn't mean it'll be easy for Ottawa to give the Kenyans information about a Canadian suspect because there's ministerial guidelines now on how you can share intelligence with countries that might be more aggressive in terms of how they handle detainees. So um, that's going to be a real trouble point, I think. For in the meantime, the Canadian government says it's providing consular assistance to Guled's family. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Ottawa. Now, when it comes to the diplomatic rift between Canada and China, the pressure's on to find some kind of a solution. But Canada's ambassador says having a leader-to-leader -leader talk, prime minister to president, not the right time. I think uh, other actions have to be taken first because it is appropriate and right for him to do it at the right time, and I'm sure he will. But I think it is more effective if other means are deployed before we get to that point. And there is a lot at stake. The dispute started when Canada arrested an executive of a Chinese telecom giant, Huawei. Now, that company wants to be part of Canada's next generation 5G wireless network, something the government is considering. We will make our judgment based on what's right for Canada uh, and, uh, and not, be, uh, not be deterred from making the right decision. So Ralph Goodale says national security will be the determining factor. But on the potential price of telling Huawei no, joining other Western countries who've done the same, China's ambassador yesterday warned of repercussions. Now, for Canada's part, Goodale was speaking as the federal cabinet wrapped up a three-day retreat in Quebec. Domestic concerns, top of mind. There's an election in October. But of all the other things competing for attention, China is just one of them. David Cochran was at the retreat. 
They came here to talk about their domestic agenda. I think one of the things that Canadians have seen over the past three years is uh, a strong growth in the economy. But the world has a way of intruding. Sherbrooke is the home of Edith Blay. The 34-year-old has been missing in Burkina Faso since December. Marie-Claude Bibo and the foreign minister met with Blay's family this morning. We had a, a good conversation uh, between mothers. We talked about is it. The risk to Blay is underscored by the case of Kirk Woodman, another Canadian found murdered this week after a kidnapping and gun battle in the same country. Can you confirm whether she's still alive? Um, as far as we know, she is. Canadians missing and murdered in Africa, detained or sentenced to death in China. One of the things that is of concern in this situation uh, uh, is the apparent blending of uh, Chinese commercial interests with Chinese political uh, positioning and consequences. This is something that uh, I think should be uh, of concern, not just to Canadians, but to people around the world. It's also a political concern for this government in an election year. It wants to talk about record job growth, its plans for the middle class. But that can all be overshadowed by an international dynamic where Donald Trump is suddenly the least of Trudeau's concerns. Indeed, elsewhere around the world, we see uh, withdrawing from democratic principles. We see uh, withdrawing from uh, the trade uh, that leads to growth. And we've made cases for trade that is more beneficial to everyone. We've delivered on that. We've delivered on the kinds of things that have allayed some of the very real anxieties people are feeling out there. That last part is the re-election pitch. But will Canadians be able to hear it? David Cochran, CBC News. Sherbrooke, Quebec. You heard David reference the U.S. president there. And uh, today, like most days, let's be honest, he's again very much in the museum. And Andrew, one report in particular is the reason why. It's from BuzzFeed News, and it could be very damaging to Donald Trump. It says that not only did he push for a Russian real estate venture during the 2016 campaign, he personally ordered disgraced former attorney Michael Cohen to lie about it to Congress. Now, if this proves to be true, it could be very problematic. Keith Bogue explores the implications. Michael, how you doing? This brief glimpse of Michael Cohen with his arm in a sling and what appeared to be a hospital bracelet on his wrist was the only public appearance by the man who might bring down the president. The cable news shows were practically bursting with melodrama about what would be an undeniable blockbuster of a story, if true. If this is true, does it mean President Trump committed a crime? Uh, means he committed three crimes. I'm telling you, Steph, I'm sitting 12 blocks from the White House, and I can almost smell the gun smoke. Whether it's really a smoking gun depends, of course, on whether it's true that President Trump directed Michael Cohen to lie to Congress. The lie was about whether Donald Trump continued to try to make a real estate deal in Moscow through the Kremlin during the election. Cohen has pleaded guilty to lying about that. But if Trump told him to lie about it, then even Trump's nominee for attorney general appears to believe Absolutely. that would be obstruction of justice. So if there was some reason to believe that the president tried to coach somebody not to testify or testify falsely, that could be obstruction of justice. Yes, under that, yeah, un under an obstruction statute, right. yeah. The president's defense, delivered in part through his daughter-in-law on Fox News, was predictable. It's ridiculous. It's all made up. And I think, sadly, Michael Cohen is a fraud and he's trying to get his last couple minutes of fame. But what's alleged is reportedly corroborated by other witnesses and by documentary evidence. It's highly concerning. And this just shows uh, that this administration and this president um, may well be complicit in, a, in participating in obstruction of justice. And since no one is arguing that what's alleged here isn't a crime and an impeachable offense, if it turns out to be true, Democrats will have to consider whether to begin the process for removing the president. Ian. So, Keith, even if the Democrats in the House were to impeach the president, the Senate needs a two-thirds vote to convict. We know Republicans are the majority there, so doesn't it stand to reason that the president would be safe? Well, it depends on what the public thinks. In the course of impeachment in the House, we're likely to get some compelling evidence that might make it harder politically for Republicans to protect him. That's ultimately what led to the resignation of President Richard Nixon in 1974. And again, if the story as reported is true, then there is no debate about whether it's a serious crime. Okay. Keith, thank you.
And late this evening, special counsel Robert Mueller's office did something it rarely does, release a statement about an ongoing investigation. It is, as you'll see, carefully worded. BuzzFeed's description of the specific statements to the special counsel's office and characterization of documents and testimony obtained by this office regarding Michael Cohen's congressional testimony are not accurate. What Mueller's office did not say was that the BuzzFeed report was untrue. The U.S. Capitol will stay busy tomorrow with the third annual Women's March, but it may be much smaller this time around, and some fear the movement is falling apart. This is what democracy looks like. Despite huge numbers of both the 2017 and 2018 Women's March, insiders say there were internal tensions from the start over race, class, and privilege. Those cracks have grown even wider over allegations of anti-Semitic remarks by some senior leaders and one co-founder's reluctance to distance herself from Louis Farrakhan, notorious for homophobic and anti-Semitic views. I don't agree with many of Minister Farrakhan's statements. That's Specifically a, that's, about Jewish people. As I said, I don't agree with many of Minister Farrakhan's statements. Several major sponsors have bailed this year, as have top Democrats like Kamala Harris, Cory Booker and Kirsten Gillibrand. Then there's senior founding member Vanessa Rubel, who split to form the competing activist organization March On. For their part, women's march leaders publicly condemn all forms of bigotry and racism, but have so far refused calls to step down. U.S. President Donald Trump is promising a major announcement tomorrow afternoon. The speculation is he might declare a national emergency to build his border wall and end the partial government shutdown. Yeah, I'm not going to get ahead of the president, uh, but I can assure you that he's going to continue fighting for border security. He's going to continue looking for the solution uh, to end the humanitarian and national security crisis at the border. Federal workers hope the announcement is about their paychecks. 800,000 government employees are either furloughed or working without pay, heading into a fifth week of limbo and uncertainty about how they'll cover their rent and mortgages and keep creditors at bay. For many, it involves some tough choices, scrimping, doing without, asking for help from family and friends, even, as it turns out, strangers. Ellen Morrow met with some of them. As soon as I have the opportunity to go back to work, I want to give back. Shay Watson has never relied on a food bank before. Now she has no choice. I need a hug. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Well, there you go. Do all your saving, all your paying, and you get to this point where you're like, I have to ask for help. So it's emotional. <laughs> and as the shutdown drags on, the anxiety over money running out is mounting. Now you have the, the citizens of the United States of America, you know, scrambling to try to find out how we're going to survive, how we're going to live. The partial shutdown is now the longest in U.S. history. And here in Washington, D.C., it's meant an increase in traffic at local food banks. You want collard greens, you want turnips, you want... And just as federal workers are under pressure, so are the organizations trying to help them. With no end in sight for the shutdown, we just don't know what will happen if our demand for services stays double. So folks, in line, appreciate you staying out in the cold. We'll a short drive short away, hundreds of federal options. workers wait outside a pop-up restaurant for a free lunch. Robert White, an FBI employee for 33 years, is one of them. He's refinanced his house to pay his bills. Does stuff like this help you as you're dealing with the shutdown? Yes, uh, because uh, I don't want to pay any money. Money going out, nothing coming in. Hi there. Hi there. How are you? The pop-up is run by a humanitarian organization that usually operates in disaster zones. It served double the amount of people it was expecting. We've been going from natural disaster to natural disaster, and now we're in a man-made disaster. And here, there's little hope the shutdown will end anytime soon. And when you watch all the negotiations and the talks trying to end it, how what do you... What negotiations? <laughs> Back at the food bank, there's anger it happened at all. These are human lives we're talking about. We're talking about a country, knowing how to govern a country. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. Those federal workers have missed more than $5,000 in wages on average over the first four weeks of the shutdown. Well, Prince Philip's car crash yesterday in the UK, it was surprising on a few fronts. That he could walk away largely unharmed, amazing. 
that a nine-month-old baby was in the other car, apparently unhurt, also incredible. And on whether Philip is ready to get behind the wheel again. Well, that might be the most interesting bit of the lot. He's 97, after all. But that and a whole host of other questions are very much open tonight. Thomas Daigle explains why. Ken, that's not good. With Prince Philip's SUV on its side and a car in the bushes, it's a wonder no one was seriously hurt. I'm still trying to get him out. Today, what's left of Philip's driver's side mirror served as a reminder of the severity of yesterday's crash. I saw a car somersaulting across the road, tumbling. Roy Warren helped Philip get out through the Land Rover's sunroof. And, and I realized that I was holding the Duke of Edinburgh and I said something to myself, something like blimey, but probably a bit stronger. He also pulled out a nine-month-old baby boy from the other car. The two women inside were sent to hospital. Philip got a checkup today as well, but Buckingham Palace says he suffered no injuries of concern. Philip was overheard telling police he'd been blinded by the sun. In his younger days, the Duke of Edinburgh was known as a speed lover, and he's portrayed that way in the Netflix series The Crown. Now at 97, royal watchers are left wondering how he survived the crash and whether he should have been at the steering wheel at his age. <laughs> Turns out drivers under 30 are more likely to get into an accident than seniors. So says this former traffic officer turned road safety campaigner. There are people in their 90s who are quite capable of turning up and passing our advanced driving test at the first attempt, whereas there are people younger who are struggling to achieve that same thing. Philip's days behind the wheel may not be over so soon. In the back of a truck at Sandringham today came another Land Rover to replace the one that was just wrecked. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, London. Here are some of the other stories we're following tonight. A British sailor has been found not guilty in a Nova Scotia gang rape trial that spanned four years. Darren Smalley was accused of sexual assault causing bodily harm and participating in a sexual assault involving one or more people back in 2015. The judge said he didn't accept what the complainant said and quote, it's impossible to know where the truth begins or ends. A judge in Alberta has dismissed the application by a couple for $4 million to cover their legal fees. David and Colette Stephan were convicted in 2016 of failing to provide the necessaries of life to their 19-month-old son. The couple chose to treat their child with natural remedies, overtaking him to a doctor. He died of bacterial meningitis. The conviction was later overturned. A new trial is scheduled for June. And ahead tonight on The National, Premier Doug Ford is promising to cut tuition in Ontario. Students pay less, but some of those very students say that plan is going to cost them big time. And we'll take you inside the Canadian stage company rocked by Me Too allegations last year. You'll hear from the woman now leading Soul Pepper into its new season. Plus, a little later in our moment of the day, an emotional bus ride in Ottawa, one week after that terrible double-decker crash. A lot of friends and family are texting her this morning and sending her positive vibes. Thank you for the support. Yeah. <laughs> It's a new season at Toronto's Soul Pepper Theatre in more ways than one. A year ago, allegations against the company's artistic director led to a dramatic fall from grace. A lot of mocking, ridiculing, um, belittling, um, and anger. It was not only sexual harassment, but sexual abuse. Four actresses accused Albert Schultz of sexual misconduct. He resigned and said he would vigorously defend himself. The company lost a planned funding increase and found itself at the center of a lawsuit. That suit was settled out of court and now the company is eager to show audiences this is a new era with new leaders who have traveled far to help Soul Pepper get its groove back. Deanna Sumanak Johnson takes us behind the scenes. Thinking is what I do. On stage, Soul Pepper Theater is sending a message. This is a hopeful, vibrant place. Behind the scenes, new artistic director Wayne Mengesha also has a message for the company's staff. I'm here because of you. 
because you stood beside this company, because you said it was important, because you doubled down, because you worked endless hours, because the people power that kept this institution alive inspired me. That's why I moved my family from Los Angeles. Soul Pepper is emerging from its darkest year. Sexual assault allegations against its former artistic director Albert Schultz cast a shadow on the institution once best known for its cutting-edge plays and loyal audiences. New executive director Emma Stenning made a big move from England to help get Soul Pepper back on track. So I'm aware, of course, that people are going to have questions, but I think the more that we put brilliant work on the stage, the more that we welcome people back into the building, I think we're seeing ultimately a real bond of support for the organization. Actually, after a, a, a wobbly moment, people have come back and they're continuing to come back. Still, there are other challenges to overcome. Soul Pepper lost a promised $375,500 of additional annual funding from the Canada Council for the Arts after the Schultz scandal broke. And the Soul Pepper Academy, once the place for young actors and directors to receive paid training, is still on hiatus. There's also the matter of attracting top actors and directors. And then do you know what the plays then in your face because you get, you get... Ravi Jane, who's worked with Soul Pepper in the past and now runs his own theater, doesn't think that should be an issue. I think there's a big, huge part of the community that feels, um, you know, by choosing Emma, by choosing Lainey, they've really taken the steps to make the changes necessary. Soul Pepper has a new code of conduct all artists have to sign. There's also a whistleblower hotline for reporting inappropriate behavior. I think it would be wonderful if trees were there. The theater's new leaders promise more transparency behind the scenes and, as far as what's on stage is concerned, more diverse material and more tours abroad. If you create the excitement, people will come and people will be inspired. And I mean, these are how the renaissances happen. It's gonna be a great day. All in hopes of ensuring that Soul Pepper's glory days aren't only in the past. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. We reached out to the lawyer representing the four women who filed those lawsuits against Albert Schultz and Soul Pepper, and there was no comment. Well, the pop panel is up next on The National, and two big stories we're tackling tonight. One, the latest fallout for R. Kelly. Sony is reportedly cutting ties. But before that, Gillette's big PR gamble, on point or offensive? And either way, will it be lucrative? And there will be no going back. Because we, we believe in the best in men. Last time I was here, I predicted that 2019 was going to be the year that iconic brands really leaned into social justice issues in their marketing. But I didn't think it was going to be this fast. This week, Gillette's The Best a Man Can Get slogan got flipped on its head in a new ad that tackles toxic masculinity. Is this the best a man can get? And it got a lot of love. But since the ad comes in the wake of Me Too, some men are feeling victimized by it. I'm Sarah Bosveld, senior writer at Chatelaine. I'm Ashani Nath, senior editor at Flare.com. I'm Donovan Bennett, host and writer for Sportsnet. Look, you can't tackle an issue like toxic masculinity during a commercial break. But we're at a moment in our culture where we all need to challenge ourselves to be better. I think this ad is just reflecting that. Listen, I am here for what this ad is saying. Let's redefine masculinity. But maybe the brand should also think about what it means to be a woman in 2019 and how their women's razors have shaped that. Okie dokie, so uh, credit where credit is due, but we're just gonna get this out of the way. Uh, here's what Donovan had to say last time he was here in the studio. I think brands, whether they be sports or otherwise, no longer are gonna have the luxury to be apolitical or amoral. They're going to have to choose a side. And in fact, I think they're gonna find it is lucrative. <laughs> Ah, uh, Donovan the Wise is what we call him now. <laughs> and, and so, <laughs> so just, just so we're all on the same page, in case you didn't see Gillette's uh, most recent ad, it's two minutes long, but we'll play just a snippet for you. But some is not enough. It's not how we treat each other, okay? Okay. Because the boys watching today will be the men. 
Okay, so Gillette uh, trying to make... I'm starting to cry already. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. God. So I know I'm really sensitive. <laughs> okay, we'll get to you in a moment. <laughs> Donovan, you, you sort of wished this into existence. Evidently. Uh, did you like it? Uh, well, I, I'm glad I wore a different outfit because that would have been telling on myself because you brought up an old clip. I didn't love it. I, I, I'm surprised on the boycott Gillette outrage. Uh, but what didn't you like about it, though? I just, it didn't, one, make me want to buy their product more than it did before I saw it, and I think that is the point. And two, if I was someone who was going to be a, a, a bully or a terrible offender and use my male privilege, it didn't really change my mind. Procter & Gamble actually had done this well in the past. They had a Pantene ad where they had NFL players kind of braiding their daughter's hair. It gave you the message a little bit gentler. This, I think, beat you over the head and tried to preach to you, and, and no one really wants to be preached. But, but I guess, I mean, there, I guess there are two criticisms, right? I, and I think what you're saying is that you just found the ad ineffective. Yes. A lot of people found it offensive, right? Which, which is kind of going above and beyond, but, but you don't think it was so offensive, you just think it just didn't work. No, I think people who found it offensive, it's a sign of the times where people are looking for a reason to be outraged, but in actuality, that's not helping. You're actually helping the brand because that hashtag boycott Gillette has people talking about Gillette. We saw that with Nike sure. and Colin Kaepernick. Their product Kaepernick. name is in it, and that's really all they care about. And, and, and what did you think about it, Sarah? I mean, well, you, you liked it. I was it. just starting to get misty. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, I've, I've told you before on the panel, I have a, a little boy at home, and so to me, I think the whole message is just like, hey, these little kids are watching us, and we have a real opportunity here in this, the culture to just do a little bit better, and I'm okay with advertisers hopping on that bandwagon, whether it means they're going to sell more razors or not. You know, I think actually what, you know, and we we use that exact clip here, but I think a lot of men were offended about the like, you know, be a good guy and break up a fight if you see one, like as if men wouldn't do that already. And so they seem to think that men, you know, it, it's kind of like demasculating men or, you know, emasculating rather is a term, like thinking that they shouldn't behave nobly or they aren't doing that already, sure, you know? Sure. And I think they were like, well, of course we already do that. And what does this company think we are, you know? And Ashana, did, did you buy the, the sincerity of the message? You know what? Like, we have to remember, this is a very calculated risk, right? They're not doing this just purely out of goodwill. Um, I like the message, personally. I would rather see that than a classic old, you know, be a man, shave, blah, blah, blah. Like, I think at least it's a step in the right direction. Um, what I wish I had seen is a, almost like a partner ad because Gillette also makes Venus. And in my mind, I know that there's people who would say that there's some science behind, you know, razors need to be different based on how they're used, but there's actually no biological reason you need to be shaving your hair. It's been put on women for so long by companies like Gillette to shave your legs because it's associated with beauty. And there was no partner ad or uh, recognition that they're part of the problem when it comes to women's beauty standards and what it means to be a woman in 2019. So I wish that there had been a little bit more of that. Um, but I guess, I mean, at a certain point, maybe do you have to concede that your, your original point, which is they're a business, right? I mean, yeah. they're, they're not a, a social and advocacy group. And women's so. razors cost more than men's yeah, razors, there's which the pink is the tax. pink tax. Yeah. yeah, so why would they want to lose money on all those extra bucks they can make off women? So I agree, like, there's a... You know, either a missed opportunity or that could be a next step, I but, think. But it's yeah. a great point, right? Because is that is that where the bar is now, right? If, if you're going to hop into this bandwagon and try to make a point that, well, you've got to go the whole nine yards. Yeah, I, I think so. And it's all about perspective, right? And so we, we see the perspectives from the women. And from a man, my perspective was, again, you, you didn't really go far enough. You, the best a man can get tagline in those ads were white males with chiseled jaws mm. that were playing sports and on Wall Street. Yeah. You didn't really... Stereotypes, too. A hundred percent. Yeah. So you didn't really address the fact that you have shaped what we think of masculinity and how you could possibly change it. But I'm okay with them sort of trying to right that ship. If they're willing to, you know, walk the talk, as we discussed about maybe, you know, changing their marketing or um, charging the same amount for the same kind of product. But I th I'm okay with... I just think that we absorb so many messages through advertising, through any kind of media, and we like to pretend that we don't. Bottom line, I still wonder if, if this is going to pay off for Gillette. I mean, part of your prediction last time around was that this would be a lucrative area for, for companies to get into. Yeah, and when if we're using Nike as the comp, with they did in the Dream Crazy ad with Colin Kaepernick, initially people were burning their sneakers, mm -hmm. the stock price went down, but it came back up, their stock price went up 6%, that's $5 billion just from an ad, and they didn't pay Kaepernick $5 billion to be in it. So I think 
Gillette is making the same sort of calculation, and we're talking about them on a very watch network. I think they're winning. I, I do want to take maybe a bit of a, a hard turn to the other topic that we wanted to discuss, although, although it is, you know, as well a long-standing issue that is perhaps reaching a pivot point. Can you describe the physical abuse? <laughs> God, I can't take another day. I can't do this anymore. It shouldn't have happened. Why didn't anyone notice? We all noticed. No one cared because we were black girls. I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Surviving R. Kelly. Okay, I told you we were taking a turn. Um, so those are scenes from the Lifetime documentary series Surviving R. Kelly. It has blown wide open the conversation around a singer whose career has been plagued with rumors of abuse and sexual impropriety with underage girls. R. Kelly flatly denies the accusations against him, although now there are reports that Sony has dropped him from their label. But uh, I want to be clear before we dive into this. We are, we are not here to discuss what parts of the allegations or the accusations may be true or untrue. And this isn't a courtroom, right? But, but the series has undeniably had an impact. So, so let's talk about it. Ishani, and given this latest development, tell me what you think it was about the documentary that, that perhaps pushed Sony over the edge here. You know what? I think, and I, I hate that I am saying this, but I think in other situations that we've seen in the past year, for example, with Weinstein, we felt a, a connection to some of the women that were coming forward because they were famous. We felt like we knew them. We didn't know these women in this, in this way until this documentary. This documentary made it so di like, impossible to look away. And even that clip right there, like, I still, it is visceral. Um, the reaction that you get as a viewer to watch these women talk about their stories and um, what they allegedly went through, it's, it's really hard and to, you can't look away. Basically. You know, uh, so undeniably, there's there's the power of, of the documentary. We're also in a different era, yeah. though, right? I mean, yeah. I think of Me Too. In your mind, is is that what's also pushing this wave forward? A absolutely. I mean, it, it had been this open secret, um, you know, and he had been in criminal court, and mm -hmm. of course, you know, it, it didn't proceed, and he was he was acquitted, found acquitted, yeah, you know, and certainly ago. went out on bail, and it was business as usual. But in in the uh, you know celebrity world that we live in, back then it was like okay, as long as he was performing at a high level, songs like inspirational songs like I Believe I Can Fly, mm -hmm. just kind of allowed him to hide in plain sight as an as. You know, an alleged abuser, I believe, a, a lot of people said in that documentary. And I think now uh, we've been seeing a lot of hindsight is 2020 with Me Too, you know, really things that should never and were never okay back then now are seen with the modern context in view of, okay, now we're going to acknowledge that this may, you know, has happened or people are coming forward saying it happened. We can do something about it now. And I think that's where, why we're seeing a lot of the actions of, of labels dropping the artist of a lot of uh, artists who worked with Kelly, Lady Gaga is one example, pulling their music from streaming sites, apologizing. You know, we're, we're seeing a lot of that now, and I think it, it wouldn't be happening without uh, that huge moment that Me Too brought, um, with really also centering survivors' stories to actually having them be listened to and believed, which is huge, because I don't think a lot of these women were believed for a long, long time. And, and Donovan, I mean, not, not to make you make another prediction, but, but I mean, is this actually... A turning point. And I ask that because, I mean, first of all, R. Kelly, he's been in this place before, right? When I mentioned the acquittal from, from several years ago, that was in relation to a very particular incident, and, and there are other allegations mm -hmm. uh, that are out there. But, but also, you look at the streaming numbers for R. Kelly's music, right? After the, the documentary series came out, they skyrocketed. So, so do things change from this point on? Yeah, I mean... When you say from this point on, because this started a while ago, right? Like the first person in the dock is Aaliyah. That's a long time ago. The difference, I think, and the change, I think, is the medium. None of what we saw was new. It was well reported. If you were well read on him, you knew about it. The difference was we saw it. You, mm -hmm. you said you can't look away. So the difference is finally, I think, you have enough money to do a documentary because of the Me Too movement and people are willing to put resources into these stories and we're seeing them not just in print but on screen and then you have a situation where Mute R. Kelly isn't just a small movement, it's trending on Twitter because surviving R. Kelly is trending on Twitter. I think that's the difference, that now yeah. 
everyone is really a part of this conversation. Thus, sadly, people are saying, well, there's an audience for this content. I'm willing to invest and have documentaries like this. And, and something that was a not very well hidden secret became big over the span of a couple nights. But let me jump in here just with one maybe final question, because one thing we, we don't really know the answer to is what happens to R. Kelly's career from this point on? Is it over or is it not over? And maybe my final question is, if it is over, will it be because record labels like, like Sony, RCA, will have made that decision for him, advertisers, production companies, so on and so forth, or will it be fans who say, we're done? I think it has to be both, because we're in a space right now, he is a well, well enough known name that if he gets dropped, he can still put out music, he, can, he has access to the internet, he can do whatever he wants and the fans will follow him in theory. So I think it has to be both. Okay, well, we shall see, as they say. Guys, thanks so much, as always. Thank you. That was a great conversation. Up next on The National, we'll take you inside a protest at the Ontario Legislature today, why students are upset over the government's plan to cut tuition. First, though, a look at the Sunday interview. Jagmeet Singh, leader of the NDP, fighting for a seat in the House of Commons. Rosie caught up with him earlier this week. They talked about pipelines, jobs, and diplomacy with China. There's a Canadian right now who's been convicted by a Chinese <coughs> court to, uh, to a death sentence for alleged drug smuggling. How would you deal with a situation like that? we got to stand up to China. We have to be ready to stand up to, to anyone that we need what to stand up to. What does that mean, though, stand up well, to China? We've got to say, listen, uh, what you're doing is, is just wrong. Mm -hmm. you, you can't take individual people and use them as political pawns, uh, detain people without due process. Yeah. Canadians expect that, that we take care of Canadian citizens. And right now, we've got Canadians that are being detained, and they don't know the reason why. They're not being afforded due process. Mm -hmm. They don't have access to lawyers. Mm -hmm. They don't know the charges against them. No. I mean, these are basic things that we should demand. There's a Bible with reading for Sunday. What reading? It's church on Sunday. We promised to come after last time you don't come because you was a hangover. I don't remember that. Because you was a hangover. Welcome back. Here are some of the stories we're watching tonight, beginning with a reminder of the dangers of lithium-ion batteries on planes. The Transportation Safety Board says that's what caught fire last June on WestJet 113. It was bound for Vancouver from Calgary. The plane safely returning to Calgary. The batteries belonged to a passenger who had inadvertently packed them in his luggage for his e-cigarette. A storm of this magnitude, 10 centimeters, will have probably 1,100 pieces of equipment working. The city of Toronto bracing for the first big storm of this winter. 200 salt trucks, 600 road plows are at the ready. And the snow warning will affect the U.S. Northeast as well. Philadelphia and New Jersey has already declared a state of emergency. Environment Canada warning travelers to postpone trips this weekend because of the snow. All smiles at this Cape Breton call center today. Very different scene from last month when the former Servicom call center was closed, putting people out of work just weeks before Christmas. Now under new management, it's back to work. And today, the 480 employees got their first paychecks. The company says business is going well. They plan to expand, adding even more jobs. Doug Ford's government is directing its attention to post-secondary institutions in Ontario. It's all part of its latest cost-cutting efforts, but not all the changes are being well-received. Ontario's Government for the People is introducing an unprecedented 10% tuition reduction. That's good news for students, but two things. A cut to tuition means a cut to college and university budgets, 2 to 4%. That could affect students down the line, but... Financial aid is changing too. Under the previous government, an increase in grants essentially made school free for those from low-income families. But now, they'll get a mix of grants and loans. I pay for all my university myself, and I work 30 hours already, so um, this OSAP hike will be very difficult for me to um, continue my studies. Plus, students will have to repay those loans starting right after graduation. The six-month grace period currently in effect, that's done. Education's under attack! What do we do? Pay the piper! 
For some, it's just too much. And today, many were out voicing their frustration. And there's actually another cut on the table. Students will be able to opt out of additional fees, just choose not to pay them. But losing out on what those fees pay for, that has some students very worried. Ron Charles looks at what's at stake. Student services are a right. We will not give up the fight. Ironically, the protest outside Ontario's legislature is against a plan that targets the very money that helps fund demonstrations like this. That's disgusting! The Ford government's plan allows students to opt out of fees that fund their student unions, campus clubs and newspapers, and would scrap a mandatory fee to the Canadian Federation of Students, the rally's organizers. But its biggest concern is what it may mean for organizations and services on campuses. And I think that it's very paternalistic for the government to say that, you know, we're providing you this opt-out feature when really that's just going to take the legs out from under these organizations who try to provide crucial services for students. Services like a legal clinic at Ryerson University. Um, How well is that used? A lot of students? A lot. He's always overbooked. Um, we, have, um, we have tax clinics that we uh, open up during tax season for the students. The government says fees for essential student health and safety services would still be mandatory, but everything else... So as an example, would an LGBTQ program or group or club, will that be deemed mandatory? That's up to the institutions themselves to decide. So. But you're giving them the option to make that a mandatory program? Uh, I, I'm under the understanding that that would be con considered an opt-out or... What, would, what we're doing is making classifications of, of, uh, of fees. At Carleton University, students are contemplating the pros and cons of being able to avoid about $700 a year in fees. I want to pay for what I want, but then it takes away from others. You should be able to choose which ones you want to participate in. That sounds simple, but student groups say they will opt in for a fight against the new policy because it could threaten their very survival. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. Next on The National, one week after surviving the Westboro bus crash, Elizabeth gets back on the bus. Let's go. You know, we gave Elizabeth strategies um, to you listen to her music. A lot of friends and family are texting her this morning and sending her positive vibes. Are you both applying for the job? Oh, no, I'm just here for support. It's Mark's first interview, and I just want to make sure he doesn't blow it. Oh. He's not wrong to worry about that. In many ways, I do not want this job, but in other ways, the money, I do want it. Wow, that is a refreshingly honest answer. Oh, he also has his CPR certificate. Yeah, but that stands for cool prankster rascal. You said that was for first aid. Yeah, because I was pranking you like a cool rascal. <laughs> Kim's Convenience, Tuesdays at 8 on CBC. It has been a week since the deadly bus crash in Ottawa, and Westboro Station has become a memorial of sorts to the victims, people leaving flowers and messages, but it's still a working station. All this week, passengers have had to grapple with getting back on the bus. One of them is Elizabeth Langan. We told you about her a couple of days ago. She was on the bus when it crashed into the station. Members of her neighborhood have reached out to her on Facebook to help her feel confident about getting back on board. Well, today she rode the bus for the first time since the crash, and that is our moment of the day. To make it easier, a familiar driver who knew her name. But Elizabeth's mother also had a plan. You know, we gave Elizabeth strategies um, to you listen to her music. A lot of friends and family are texting her this morning and sending her positive vibes. Someone from OC Transpo rode the bus along with Elizabeth and her mom. And an OC Transpo car followed behind the bus in case Elizabeth needed to disembark. Okay. And then you're just, he's going to follow behind us, okay? Mm -hmm. So if there's anything, but she's got it, it's no problem. And she did, for the most part. Elizabeth became emotional when Westboro Station was announced. 
The rest of the ride passed uneventfully and ended with high fives all around. Gosh, I, I, I love this story, Ian. And, uh, you know, a noteworthy point to add on to all of this maybe is that for this morning's bus ride, Elizabeth was sitting in the priority seating area right at the front of the bus, which is the same area that she had been sitting on during the crash uh, on uh, last Friday when the bus crashed. So, you know, it's great that she's getting back on the horse. You think of all the support that she's getting. I also think, as you mentioned at the start, of all those people who also have to get on the bus, who were part of Friday's crash, but who may not be getting that same level of encouragement, your heart really goes out to them. And of course, let's remember the three people who were killed exactly one week ago this evening. Uh, funeral arrangements for one of them hasn't yet been uh, made public. Uh, Bruce Tomlinson had a visitation today, and there's a celebration of life tomorrow for Judy Booth. There's a really nice article online about her on CBC. She was a piper. Many pipers will be gathering tomorrow to mark her, her life and her passing. That is The National for January the 18th. Good night. Good night.